Madonna. All right. Hello. Welcome. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I'm Nick Nisi. I'm a JavaScript developer, like many of you. Uh, and I work for a company called SitePen. Um, there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we're hiring. Uh, I'm also on two podcasts, JS Party and TalkScript, both of which are here. Uh, JS Party just had the stage in the last, uh, over lunch in the last, in the other room. And uh, come stop by either of those booths. Uh, I'll be over at the TalkScript booth throughout the day. Uh, so please stop by and we're, we're interviewing speakers and attendees. Uh, so I am a dynamic language enthusiast. I'm a full stack JavaScript developer uh, and this is how I would describe myself. I really like JavaScript uh, and I think I like it and I think I got into it because it was a dynamic language. So uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got here. Uh, I graduated from college in 2008 uh, and the primary languages that were taught in my computer science classes were C and C++. Um, these were really nice languages. Uh, I learned a lot from them and learned, I think I became a better programmer. I was actually the last class that took C and C++. They switched over to Java after that. I think I got the better education, so I'm happy about that. Um, I also took an elective Perl class, and this is my first real introduction to a dynamic language, and I loved how productive I could be quickly. I didn't have to worry about a make file, which I didn't understand uh, at the time, and I didn't have to worry about all of this setup and how I was going to run and how, like, freeing memory and all of that. I think that was the most freeing part. I could just start writing code, run it, and if there was errors, I'd get those thrown at me and then I could deal with them. Uh, so that was my first real dynamic language. Um, I did experiment once in college with JavaScript, um, but Perl was, was the first real one. I just loved how flexible it was. So the, the JavaScript that I wrote in um, college was just for one class and it was just an add-on to a, a software engineering project that I was working on with a few other developers. And this was probably around 2007. And this is what the code looked like. Um, it was exceptionally terrible. Uh, I think I should get bonus points for how terrible it was. If you look in there, there is a with statement in there. That's amazing. Um, and what this code did was we wanted to add a Gmail style loading indicator like you see in the top right corner. Gmail used to look like that in 2007 uh, and we wanted to add that to our page but we weren't really doing any kind of uh, XHR calls or anything like that. We were just had serving PHP pages but we wanted to have this fancy look and feel. So I found in a book some code that looked like this that was making the Gmail loading indicator happen and I wanted to make that happen. I didn't really understand the code at all, so I pretty much copied it verbatim, as you do, and uh, that ended up with me in the page that I was requesting, making a AJAX request for the page that I was on, just so that I would have an asynchronous request in there that would take a little bit of time. I even had a math.random on there so that the URL was different each time. And then uh, it would load the page, and then once that was actually loaded, it would remove the loading indicator. So the loading indicator didn't actually signify loading of anything other than the page that you were already on, so we were just wasting time. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, and uh, I didn't touch JavaScript for a few years after this. But it got me thinking. <laughs> it got me thinking, uh, do you remember the first lines of JavaScript that you might have written? And so I asked this on Twitter last week. Uh, and I got a few responses that came back, and most of them were pretty much the same exact thing. They were, oh yeah, I was just changing the color of something, or as I was hovering over uh, a link, I wanted to change the opacity of it. And a few of them were, oh, I wanted to, to modify the page with jQuery specifically. So jQuery and JavaScript were synonymous back then uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and so this was really most people's introduction to the language through this DHTML style modifying of the page. And that's because JavaScript is just not really the best language. We were using it the way that it was designed. It's not really, it never really was designed to be the way, to be used the way that we use it today. And uh, that's proven by this quote from Brendan Eich where he's talking about JavaScript being the glue language that part-time developers and designers would use to glue together the components that the real programmers who were writing Java would be writing. And obviously we've moved past that, but in a lot of ways this was how a lot of us got started including me. My first job was writing Java. I was working on a, a big Java application, and 
Uh, it was also a portal application, so we were designing several portlets that would go into the page, and it did have a lot of JavaScript on the pages that were doing things like event handling and uh, some simple client-side validation, things like that, but we didn't really treat JavaScript like a real language, and so we didn't test JavaScript, we didn't uh, architect it, we just kind of threw it in wherever we wanted it, and that meant that any portlet that was going to use some JavaScript method, we would just use that to pollute the global namespace with whatever methods uh, that it needed. And that ended up being where we'd have like a click handler function that was duplicated on in every single portlet and it would just pollute the global namespace with all of that. So it was really exceptionally terrible. Um, but that's just what we ended up doing on this. Also, uh, this application specifically only had to work in IE6. It did not work in Firefox. It, Chrome wasn't really a thing back then. Uh, it only worked in IE6 and nothing else. Not IE7 or anything, just IE6. Uh, and it relied on some weird quirks mode bugs to get the, the drop-down navigation to work. So if you tried to load it in another browser, it actually wouldn't work at all. And so uh, I, I did a lot of Java and a lot of JavaScript uh, and, but it was just this simple JavaScript. But then we got the opportunity to create the first real JavaScript component that we would use in this application. Uh, but of course, I didn't want to have to do this in IE6 because IE6 was just terrible. So uh, I started looking at GreaseMonkey and writing a script that would modify the page in real time without actually changing our source code so that it would work in Firefox and we could navigate through the pages uh, and use Firebug to actually do some testing. And so the first real component that I created was a, um, a slide navigator. So kind of like a PowerPoint in the browser a little bit, but way, way simpler. Uh, and it was all written in JavaScript. We started with prototype and then moved on to jQuery. And it was awesome, but it was terrible code. Um, but I really embraced that spaghetti code that I was writing. It was a lot of fun to write, um, not a lot of fun to test or to debug later on, of course. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. It's just a lot of fun to, to be a part of that. So there's this, this uh, quote from Brendan Eich, always bet on JavaScript. And uh, this saying kind of accurately depicts the past, present, and future of the language. Uh, since this is the language of the web, uh, the language is kind of set off at a disadvantage from the start, or I'm sorry, at an advantage from the start over any other language because if you are writing code in the browser, it is JavaScript. So we're using this language that was never really designed to, uh, to have the role that it does, but we can't really get away from it. So uh, I saw this on Reddit last week and thought it was really funny. Um, the, the nice thing about this language, though, is that because of its unique uh, position as the language of the web, that means that if you're working on an application in another language, like Java or Ruby or uh, .NET or um, name anything else. If it's touching the web, that project probably has JavaScript in it somewhere. And that's a really cool thing because that means that these uh, programmers that are programming in other languages get to bring all of their um, experiences and their design decisions and their um, ideas over to this language and try and influence it. And so Java, JavaScript really gets to grow out of that. Um, some ways better than others. Um, a lot of Times people have tried to come in and change the language into something else. Uh, that's true with Flash or GWT or CoffeeScript, Dart. Um, these languages that, that try to usurp JavaScript as the language of the web and change it into something else that it's clearly not. Um, they are all failures. They're still around in a lot of ways, but they're failure, failures in that they don't really have a significant market share, uh, not in the way that JavaScript does, and they never will. And the reason is they didn't bet on JavaScript. Um, they instead tried to change it into something else. They didn't embrace it. We're kind of going through this again, potentially, with WebAssembly. Um, it's not trying to be a replacement for JavaScript, but will it be? Uh, time will tell, I guess, on that. There's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do, and I'm really excited for what's coming down with WebAssembly. Um, but from their own website, uh, it talks about it being a complement to JavaScript, where you can do the computationally intensive stuff in WebAssembly in a language that transpiles to WebAssembly, and then hand that off to JavaScript and work with it like that. They also have this interesting quote that JavaScript uh, has an incredible amount of momentum and will remain the single privileged dynamic language of the web. And that's true, um, but it makes me wonder if their intentions are to, to bring forth another competitor that's not a dynamic language. 
So uh, there's a lot of benefits to both static and dynamic, dynamically typed languages. Um, JavaScript obviously is a dynamically typed language, and that means that it's very flexible. Uh, it's less verbose. There's not as much syntax or ceremony that we have to do to get things done. And it's more tolerant to change because it does a lot of type coercion, which is not necessarily a good thing, but it's something that uh, a lot of our code might do from time to time. Uh, it also relies less on semantics, and it's easier to test because we don't have these nominal types that we have to meet before we can mock things out, for example. And it does provide us with a console and a REPL. Statically typed languages uh, do provide a lot of benefits as well, though. They uh, will bubble the errors uh, up to the top earlier. We don't have to run our code or run our code in a specific way to see the error. Um, if there is a, a syntax error or a logic error, uh, the compiler can usually catch those. We get better encode documentation through things like type definitions and interfaces. Uh, and the compiler is a big, a big advantage in that it allows for a uh, disconnect between the language you're writing and the, the code that's running. Uh, and in there, they can uh, optimize the performance and runtime efficiency of the application. Uh, and overall, it can provide a better design time experience over time because you get uh, a lot of benefits in tooling that you don't really get with dynamic languages. So why have there been all of these attempts to replace JavaScript's role uh, in, on the web? Uh, well, it's because JavaScript, like we, we mentioned, it's not an application or a language that was built to handle the responsibilities that it has. And the responsibilities that it has are just too important now because the web is just huge. And JavaScript projects are changing uh, as well. So we are continuing on with the language. Uh, it's a great language. It's had a lot of changes that I'll, I'll get to uh, more recently. But the way that it was designed, it wasn't really hand, um, set up to handle these tasks. But JS projects, uh, they, ha they do share a lot of similar characteristics uh, as we use them more and more and create them. Uh, the size of JavaScript projects are growing exponentially. They're getting bigger and bigger. And the amount of time that they survive is getting longer and longer. So they survive several iterations with different frameworks, different um, different developers, that's the lifetime of the project, so we might have several developers coming and going on the project. And they're getting really complex to where you don't have just a single person that understands every intricacy of the application. You have several people, and then they may come and go over time. So these, in, these characteristics do introduce some bottlenecks uh, to understanding the code, and this leads to some increased risks as we try and change and refactor the code. Uh, and in dynamic languages, this can be a little difficult to, to uh, work with. And JavaScript just wasn't designed for this. So over the, the years, we have worked out ways to mitigate this risk that's uh, imposed by, and not just in JavaScript, but in several languages. Um, but we, we really try and follow uh, key practices like encapsulation, reuse, modulariza modularization, error detection, code style, uh, and annotation. And we've done that through frameworks that have come out. So the language itself doesn't provide us with a whole lot, or it hasn't in the past, so we had to fill that in. And that's where uh, frameworks like Dojo originally filled in a lot of missing functionality with things like modules and uh, promises and things like that. And then jQuery really redefined the way that we, inter uh, we interact with the DOM, required JS, uh, a whole uh, module framework. And then uh, component libraries like Backbone and Angular really helped to define that. So this has all been in user land where we've been innovating in JavaScript to make up for the shortcomings in the language. But of course, this is 2018, and that, I'm talking about JavaScript from, from years ago. Uh, 2018 JavaScript is much, much better and much, much better equipped to handle a lot of the uh, responsibilities that it has, and that's because it has changed in a lot of ways. We've had several new features to the language to make it uh, have better syntactic sugar so that we can be more expressive in our code and adding new features that we need to do things like asynchronous code uh, in a more readable way, a more human readable way, uh, and introducing our own module syntax. And so these things combined with uh, uh, newer features and tools, things like NPM, NPM being the, the package manager for JavaScript, meaning the package manager for the web, uh, really allows us to fulfill the encapsulation, reuse, and modular, modularization um, risk mitigators that uh, I defined here. Others include um, static analysis tools like ESLint for advanced error detection earlier with, with JavaScript. Wherever we can, we want to get that feedback 
uh, back to the developer as fast as possible. We also introduce a compile step with Babel now uh, because we want to run tomorrow's JavaScript today, and the only way to do that is to transpile back to a, lang to a version of JavaScript that can run. Uh, and then advanced testing frameworks. JavaScript has really uh, adopted a, a community of testing, and so that has really advanced the tooling around that as well, and that really helps to get error messages back to developers uh, quickly. And then code style, we've, we've kind of standardized uh, quite a bit on the language itself providing better syntactic sugar for us to be more expressive in the ways we want to do things. That's things like destructuring, arrow functions, uh, rest and spread, and default values. We don't have to have some obscure syntax to do that now. Our code is much more readable as a result. But then beyond that, whether we have spaces or um, tabs or uh, single or double quotes or any of that, we can kind of wash all of that away with a prettier config, which is really great. So we can rewrite the code. We can write the code any way we want and then rewrite it to the way that everyone agrees on. But the big uh, missing thing is annotation. And we can provide annotations uh, in JavaScript by annotating our code with comments, like js.comments or, um, or other things. But if we really want to take advantage of, of any real um, enforceable annotations, we need to switch to something like Flow or TypeScript. And so as code, these code bases are getting bigger, it's getting really difficult to rely on unit tests alone for uh, any kind of large refactoring efforts. And as this quote points out, um, just relying on a test suite to do any kind of large refactoring uh, is a huge coefficient of friction on actually doing that because you don't really want to break the entire application in subtle ways that you may not realize and that your tests may not be catching. And so unit tests really aren't cut out for that. I'm not saying that, that types should replace unit tests, uh, but they are a good complement to that. And so that's where uh, I start talking about TypeScript now. So uh, TypeScript was created in, um, at Microsoft by Anders Heilsberg, who created uh, C Sharp and Turbo Pascal and Delphi. And uh, it was released publicly in 2012. And it adds type annotations, uh, interfaces, and generics, and more to the language. So it's, it's really a layer on top of JavaScript that adds all of this to give us these uh, statically typed advantages in our dynamic JavaScript language. Uh, it's a very active community. Version 3 was just released, and uh, it's a strict superset of JavaScript. And I think that that's probably the biggest takeaway with it is it's not a language like CoffeeScript or Dart that's trying to change JavaScript into something else. It's fully embracing JavaScript and then extending it with types on top of it. And so uh, it's not changing that in any way, and as long as that is one of its core design goals, uh, it, I'm a fan of that. But the types are really the least interesting part of JavaScript, of, of TypeScript. It's really what they enable. So bringing back that slide that I had, uh, the benefits of dynamic and static languages, we really get a lot of the static side over uh, with, Java, with all of the benefits of JavaScript as well, uh, we get a compile step, so we get earlier detection of mistakes in real time. We also get that with the language service. We get uh, better built-in documentation because we can annotate our code with types so that we know exactly what method signatures look like, and we uh, can't really call methods in an incorrect way like we can in JavaScript. Uh, and we also get a better design time developer experience through tooling, so we get a lot of um, benefits through the, uh, the language server that it provides. And so with that, we now have this uh, ability to easily refactor our code. Uh, we get IntelliSense so we can have auto-completion that makes sense and that is accurate. And we get a continuous feedback loop through that, that language service that will give us back information about the code that we're running and how, um, how we can use it and maybe what's wrong with it as we're typing it. So the best part of all of this is the best part of TypeScript, I think, is that you really don't have to switch to TypeScript to reap some benefits from it. Uh, you can add in this comment, this at ts check to your JavaScript file, and anything that JavaScript or the, type, the TypeScript language service can infer about your code, it will warn you about. So it will let you know if there are any problems in your code that you um, may that, that may be subtle enough that you're not seeing them, all without changing anything except adding a single comment to the page. Or you can add a jsconfig.json to your project. And Visual Studio Code uh, embraces this and uses that on all of your JavaScript, so you get that automatically. But you can get it in any, any um, editor as well. So I've got an example, uh, some example code here that is just a JavaScript file that has two methods on it. 
uh, a add method and a to relative date method. And we can just add in the TS check call uh, or TS check comment at the top. And when we do that, it's not really going to do anything yet because there's nothing really wrong. And that's because the way that we have it set up, I'm telling it not to worry about implicit any's. So um, if I disable that, now it will warn me if it doesn't really know what a value is. It's not just going to implicitly assume that these arguments are any. Instead, I need to tell it what they are. And I can do that through js.comments. So now I can use these, these uh, comments and I get feedback from the compiler whether things are right or wrong. So here I immediately can see that because I told it I passed in two numbers, uh, when I actually called it, I was passing in a string. Uh, it warned me about that. Now in here, if I change that and say the js.comment is a, this argument is a date, well, date doesn't have a replace method on it, so it's giving me a warning about that. But if I change it to a string, then everything is good. I can also, if I don't want to use js.comments, I can just give JavaScript a way, or the TypeScript language service a way to infer about my code what the value should be. And I did that through uh, adding a default argument to it, which is just an empty string, implying that the uh, ISO string argument is going to be a string. And so JavaScript, or TypeScript just immediately lets me see that and get feedback without even having to change over to JavaScript, or to TypeScript. The next best part, next best part um, is that JavaScript and TypeScript can coexist together in the same project. So if you decide that you want to rewrite over to a uh, statically typed language like JavaScript or like TypeScript, you don't have to do it all at once. You can incrementally do it slowly in any way that you like. You can change one file, or you can change all new files going forward, or you can slowly convert everything over time. And that is uh, a huge, um, that, that lessens the barrier to adoption of TypeScript, which is really great. So in this code, uh, I have a JavaScript file called article service, and I'm just running uh, my build step to show that it's all green, uh, and then I'm gonna go in and rename the file to .ts, and immediately the build will fail and I will get uh, a few errors because, again, it doesn't know what API key is, so I can go ahead and type that and give it a string, and then the article service doesn't have an API key on it, so I have to tell it that this class does have that, kind, that, uh, that property on it and that it's a string, and then the fetch articles method has a string uh, that you pass into it, and then I can also do things like delete my CommonJS specific code and switch this over to um, the ES module syntax because the compile step will convert it to CommonJS or whatever module format I'd like. Now here I'm changing that over from a string to be a new source type, which is a type that I'm creating. I'm actually creating an enum up here by converting this um, object into an enum because I don't want it to just be any string. I want it to be explicitly these six strings, one of these. If it's anything other than those six, then you should give me an error. And then finally, um, I'm creating an interface because the fetch articles method should return uh, an array of articles, but I don't really know what that looks like. And so I can express that in my code. You can't really see it on this projector, but there's comments there that are showing exactly what um, values were on there, and there were those uh, values there, but now instead of just having them in comments which aren't enforceable, I have them in an enforceable way with uh, this interface that I can uh, type check against, and I can specifically say that the fetch articles method now will return a promise that's going to resolve to uh, a um, article array. So that's a really great benefit. Uh, and then another one is that the, the type system can be subverted. So uh, one big benefit of dynamic languages is you don't have to worry about the exact way the API will look and you don't have to code all of that up and create these interfaces. You can um, subvert the type system in any way that you, at any time with these compiler checks, but you can also uh, do it by using aliases uh, to s custom types that you might create. So in the previous example where I was using an article, instead of defining that interface, maybe I don't know exactly what an article will look like. Well, I can still take advantage of that by aliasing article to be the any uh, type, and then use that throughout my code, and when I want to change it over to be an article uh, interface, I can just replace that and import the interface from anywhere and use that, and all of my code will line up. And I'm not just littering it with any statements anywhere, uh, everywhere. So TypeScript really encourages you to uh, develop by exposing these interfaces, really by uh, creating these contracts that you adhere to. Uh, and it's really simple to introduce this type checking into your project, as we've seen, uh, without really having to go fully into TypeScript 
uh, and converting everything all at once. You can do as much or as little as you like. The more that you do, the more uh, advantages that you'll get from it, though. So it provides this better uh, ergonomic story for developers on your project. Uh, it's easier for everyone to understand what the APIs are. It's easier for new developers who come onto the project. They get the smart tooling to help them uh, navigate the code base and learn it. And uh, it makes it easier to maintain that over time, especially as you need to refactor. So I work on uh, an open source project called Dojo, uh, which received a complete rewrite earlier this year, completely over to TypeScript, and specifically to strict TypeScript, uh, because one main focus is on developer experience, uh, and we think that TypeScript really helps us to deliver on that. So um, it's a really cool project, and I encourage you to check it out. And so I'll leave you with, should you use TypeScript? Probably yes, um, but you can decide at which level you want to adopt it and then slowly increment that over time. Uh, this quote from Ken Wheeler, these days if, uh, if you aren't typing your JS, you're driving without a seatbelt on. I think that that's totally, uh, totally realistic and uh, I believe that. And uh, so I'll leave you with always bet on JavaScript or a strict superset. <laughs> so thank you. Um, again, I'm going to be over at the, the TalkScript podcast booth, so come check us out. And Thank you very much.